In this video, we are going to cover in overview fashion chapter 13 from Language Proof and Logic. So you already in chapters 9 and 11 have been introduced to the universal and existential quantifiers and their use in ordinary English sentences, translating from ordinary English into symbolic logic notation, and looking at uh, sentences that are fairly uncomplicated, um, that is quantified sentences that are fairly uncomplicated, and then uh, in chapter 11, fairly complicated sentences involving multiple quant quantifiers. So here we're going to look at how quantifiers function in proofs. More specifically, we are going to look at introduction and elimination rules for the universal and existential quantifiers, and then some basic strategies for enlisting the uh, rules in a proof. So first, um, let's re quickly review what it is we're looking at when we look at a quantified sentence. So uh, take a look at the, um, the example under the first bullet point. All men are mortal. Socrates is a man, so Socrates is mortal. Notice that the first sentence, all men are mortal, is a quantified sentence. More specifically, we've got the universal quantifier that ranges across uh, men things, if you will, and mortal things. Our second sentence is an atomic sentence, but it's an atomic sentence involving an individual constant, specifically the name Socrates. So remember that we can have uh, quantified sentences that are atomic, and in this case we have uh, a quantified sentence that is not atomic, that is it's a quantified sentence that involves two classes of thing that are related to each other by the conditional, by the arrow. And then our conclusion is another uh, um, singular sentence, that is a sentence that is atomic and involves a named entity, again Socrates. So when we're looking at the ordinary language uh, argument here, right, when we're looking at each sentence and then we combine the sentences to form an argument where Socrates is mortal is the conclusion, we, we recognize that the move from the premises, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, to the conclusion Socrates is mortal is, is fairly natural. It doesn't take a lot of thinking to get to it. But when we work uh, with sentences that are quantified, we can't simply draw the inference, right? We've got to do some work on the quantified sentence in order to dismantle the conditional claim. So let's think about how we're going to work on quantified uh, arguments in terms of how we first need to deal with the quantified sentence before we can work on the internal components. For example, here, how we can work on dismantling the conditional. Once we get to the point where we can dismantle uh, or assemble as needed uh, sentences by way of connectives, we're back in the chapter 6 and 8 territory which, with which you're already familiar. So, just as a review of what I've just said, we are going to need to eliminate, uh, in the example that you've just seen, uh, a quantifier, so we're going to need elimination rules for that. And then in other cases we're going to need to introduce quantifiers in order to uh, work on arguments in quantifier logic. So as with our previous rules we know that the uh, intro and elim pairs are uh, going to be presented to us for our quantified or our quantifiers, namely our universal and our existential just as we had intro and limb rules for negation, conjunction, disjunction, the con uh, conditional, and the biconditional. So first, let's take a look at universal elimination. It's uh, arguably, um, along with existential intro, as we'll see later, uh, a pretty natural feeling rule, right? When we have a universally quantified sentence, we're exhausting everything that uh, universal quantifier covers so that any name we give the uh, uh, predicate 
is going to apply. So if everything is P, then any name we offer uh, in identification of uh, the variable for P is going to apply. So let's suppose that in our uh, rule we're saying everything is perfect. Um, we're going to then be able to say that if it's the case that everything is perfect, it certainly follows that A is perfect. So now look at the rule as applied in the example that we uh, saw starting out. If every man is mortal and Socrates is a man, it follows that Socrates is mortal. But first, we have to eliminate the uh, quantifier and instantiate the variable with the name Socrates so that the conditional elimination rule can apply. So at line three, we eliminate the universal and we offer up the relevant instance, in this case Socrates, and then at line four, using lines two and three, we have Socrates is mortal. Universal introduction is a little bit more complicated. And uh, remember this is an overview or a basics chapter, so I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the universal intro rule, just like I won't get into the nitty gritty of the existential elimination rule, which uh, is, is also um, more complicated than their respective counterparts. But I'll ask you to look at the videos where I try to try to offer ways for you to think about these rules, to wrap your head around the rules so that they make more sense. Short story is this. There are two versions of universal intro. Um, you'll notice that each of the universal intro rules involves an assumptive proof. You'll notice also that the uh, assumptive name is going to be a hypothetical name. In Fitch, you'll see that the A that's not in a parenthetical is boxed up. Uh, more on that in another tutorial on uh, the, um, the uh, hypothetical name in uh, the uh, quantifier subproofs. So the universal intro involves assuming that there is some name A, right? It's a randomly chosen name. It's an arbitrary name because it's randomly chosen, because it's arbitrary, because it's hypothetical. It acts something like a variable. So uh, now take a look first at the universal intro of the conditional variety. You already know what conditional intro is. You assume the antecedent of the sentence you want to prove, derive from it the consequent so that you can say, look, if I have P, then I have Q. I've just proven that on the vertical. I'm asserting it now on the, on the horizontal. Well, similarly for the universal intro, what you're doing is you're saying, look, if I have some randomly assumed name A and I derive, uh, and I assume that that uh, name A is P and I derive from that that A is also Q, it follows that any P is Q. Now take a look at the right side uh, of the rule, the um, universal intro that does not involve the arrow. So, so this rule, this version of the universal intro applies to uh, any universally quantified sentence that does not involve the conditional, that does not involve the arrow. Here you simply assume the uh, hypothetical name. You say, let's assume there's this individual A. If from that assumption that there is this individual named A, you can prove that A has property P, it follows that anything will have this property. So notice that the assumptive sentence is a, a name or a version of a constant. It's not actually a constant, but it's a version of a constant. It's like I said, uh, a hypothetical or randomly chosen name. Uh, go ahead and read through the uh, bullet points and see if what I'm talking about here makes sense given what I uh, verbally mentioned in briefly discussing the universal intro rule. When you're ready, move on to the next, uh, or go ahead and, you know, I would say pause here, read, and then uh, resume play. So here is the worked uh, example. 
where we assume the antecedent of the conclusion with the randomly chosen name. Notice that in my example, I don't have the uh, randomly chosen A boxed up like I would in Fitch. But remember that boxing up is just a way for Fitch to recognize that we're talking about a randomly chosen name. And then we work through the example where we eliminate the universal, we work on the uh, arrow uh, for the uh, elements in uh, question, um, and then we move to the conclusion of the subproof that this randomly chosen individual A is successful. Um, let's see. Notice that we've got conditional limb uh, at line six, or sorry, at line five uh, from four and three. Notice also that we have a universal limb at line six. And uh, the uh, conditionally limb again uh, enlisted this time uh, at to justify line seven from lines uh, five and six. Once we've uh, derived the, the subproof conclusion we want, we can say, look, since A is arbitrarily chosen, it's a hypothetical name, uh, it follows that uh, from the assumption that A is a diligent student, I've derived the sentence A is successful, so it follows that any or every diligent student is successful. That's three to seven universal intro of the conditional variety. Uh, the two rules uh, for existential, the intro and the elim, are next. Um, existential intro is, like universal elim, pretty natural feeling, if you will. The mental fit is good. So uh, think about it this way. Um, you can make a, a, a restricted generalization, if you will. Um, if it's true that uh, uh, Mia is talking right now, then it follows someone is talking, right? I wouldn't say, uh, I wouldn't, it wouldn't feel natural, if you will, for, for me to infer from the sentence Mia is talking to everyone is talking, right? That doesn't, that doesn't, you would say, no, that's not the case. On the other hand, the restricted generalization, uh, the, the, that is the generalization to the existential does make sense. If Mia is talking, it follows that, or if Mia is speaking, it follows someone is. So that's your existential intro rule. We move from a constant to the existential. The existentially limb is uh, a little bit more complicated, largely because it involves the uh, um, uh, use of a subproof. Um, but you're already familiar with subproofs. Um, in addition, you're already familiar with uh, the uh, elimination of um, uh, an, an, a logical element if you go all the way back to disjunction elim, right? Remember that a disjunction sentence it, somewhere in your proof sets off the disjunction elim. Similarly, when you see an existential claim in your proof, that will set off existential elim, right? So you have some sentence, there is some P, right? So you might say something like, well, uh, uh, someone is here, right? Some person is here, and you've and that sentence is symbolized by existential x p x. Well, let's assume the person here is a. Okay, let's let's uh, provide a hypothetical name. From that elimination, you derive the sentence you want q. It follows that from that elimination, you've proven q. Again, uh, there are I've got a number of videos that that offer up. Uh, some more robust discussion of uh, the existential and limb rule, including the restrictions on it. So I encourage you to look at those. This just gives you a sense of what the mechanics, if you will, of the rule are. Um, we that Those videos will also include discussions of why it is that for existential elimination, like for universal intro, the hypothetical name that you offer up can't already be in use, right? So we'll talk more about why that's the case, but just know that it's the case. The uh, subproof name is a name that's not already in use. 
So uh, what I do offer here is a little bit of a, of a way into the existential limb rule. Um, I would pause the video here and read through it. Uh, and if it makes sense, great. If it doesn't, again, I've got ways for you to think about this in other videos. When you're ready, go ahead and resume play. Here is an example of uh, the um, existential elim rule. Notice that when the existential elim bleh, sorry, notice that when the existential elim rule is used, um, it is used prior to any universal elim. Why? Because rem remember the restriction. When you inaugurate an existential elim. Uh, uh, strategy, that is you start an existential limb subproof, you use a name not already in use, and so you uh, start with your existential limb, from there you're good to go on the universal limb. Again, if you're not quite sure why it's the case, um, uh, there are, uh, I've got some uh, further videos talking about it. Meanwhile, I hope this brief overview helps you get started on language proof and logics, chapter 13.